Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The me and team. Ed Jin. With guest co-host. One crazy Canadian. Except now everything's a beta. So early access, buy the game and you're in the beta. Yep. <laughs> if you just buy the game, you're often in the beta. Yep. Even after release. <laughs> uh, welcome to episode 226. We have Makalua. Powered by Tim Tams. Mad Jin. Powered by Tim Tams. Me and Team. <laughs> Powered by trolling. Dan Q. You know, 2K, it's been a while since you've announced something Civ related right before we recorded an episode. What's up with that? And I'm one crazy Canadian. The N is missing from my Civ Fanatics username. Now, why is that? Because I know the N key was working, or presumably your N key was working because you already have one N in your name. What happened with that? It was too long. I try to use variations because different forums don't allow it or people steal my name. So, like, my Skype name is Uno Crazy Canuck just because I couldn't have one. It's just very infuriating. So instead of having one crazy Canadian on this call, we have three crazy Canadians on this call. Well, there's something cool about the one crazy Canadia, too. I gotta say, that, that, that's nice. It does you have can, a certain flair to it. Yeah, you call it Canadia rather than Canada and kind of annoy people. It's like you're not even doing it on purpose, but you're still doing it. It's great. <laughs> the great empire of Canadiana. Exactly. And uh, Mackie, I want to thank you for your restraint <laughs> of saying something out loud. <laughs> I'll just type it in the chat instead. You're welcome. I gave you the look that you usually give us. And... <laughs> that look? Uh, no. Oh, geez. Speaking of AI, oh, I was waiting uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, wait, wait, wait. I have to find a segue. I have to find a segue. So, hey, there's a Civ Battle Royale going on. Somebody put 40 to the C. Who's the user here? Oh, T Pangolin. We had him on at some point, or we just read a lot of his posts. He was a guest on episode 192 of Polycast last year, and since last summer, he's been a regular co host on Modcast. Uh-huh. Well, he has a map where he has 42 AI civs that are duking it out by themselves. I guess this is using observer mode to watch. He has been Twitch streaming it. He's up to turn 265 so far. Actually, he's up a little past that. Oh, he hasn't it? updated that oh, okay. threaded. It's up to part 14, turns 266 to 278. Going on for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And actually tying a little bit into the previous topic as well, not just on the AI front. There are more than 40 mods in use. Most notably, including Longer Eras Historic, what this does is it takes the base game stats of a normal game and increases the science requirements for technology by 300% to be on par with a marathon game. Wow. And also includes more luxuries. It adds nine luxuries to the game and an additional mercantile city-state luxury. Info Addict, which adds time-based graphs showing civilization score, gold, military power, etc. that often come up in the imager albums that summarize a particular set of turns for people who either do or do not watch the live streams. But my favorite mod inclusion, no, it's not the fact that Canada's in there. Damn it, I was going to make that joke. High five. Woo-hoo. A five <laughs> is the aggressive and expansive AI. Increases AI expansionist and military tendencies. Increased all AI leaders' victory, wonder, city-state competitiveness, possible war approach, and possibility of war declaration, as well as tendency to expand and produce military units. Warning, do not expect improved AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, not improved, just more in your face. There's so many tiny cities in, like, the Great Tundra in the Hunnic Empire, the Great Inuit Empire, the Great Canadian Empire, that cities no one would normally build. Yeah, that many AIs on one map, even if it was a huge map, is just, like, everybody with their elbows and the other person's armpits. Yes, and this is a map of Earth that's being played on, and there are some fan Reddits. Mm-hmm. So this is a subreddit. Of a subreddit of a subreddit. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, it's getting very, very uh... meta. I think just from the names of their subreddits, you can get an idea of what's going on in the game. Australia, their subreddit is Remove Kiwi. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
There's the uh, the Buccaneers. Arr, LMAO. But my favorite, and to tie it back to Canada being in the game, the Canada fan subreddit is Canifest Destiny, <laughs> and the um, the USA is Remove Canifest Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> they are at war in the uh, last update that I saw. Let's just say it, it's not following an historical path. Except for France blobbing. What's an NFL team doing in North America in the game? Not even a good one, either. Ah, oh, I get it. <laughs> <sighs> there was a temporary delay with the Battle Royale that it had stopped due to a technical issue. Civilization Five developer for Axis Games helped oh. to a little degree to finally resolve that and so that it can continue on. So it's unclear how long this is going to go on, but this is out for domination. Absolute world domination. So it could be going on for a while. And for those of us that play Civ, which I'm presuming is everyone who is listening to this, including those on the panel, ha, ha. someone asked T-Pain Golan, what are your system specification? And quote, how is it holding up? <laughs> uh, Has your computer <laughs> melted yet? <laughs> <laughs> and T-Pain Golan responded in March, won't be uploading my rake specs because ultimately they're nothing really special at all. I guess I can if you really, really want to see them. As of now, turns take one to two minutes. And this was back in March. So <laughs> that's not so bad considering what it is that you are doing. And he's playing about, what, 20 some odd turns at a time. Hmm. Was T-Pain the first one to do the 42? Is this the, the original 42 game, or is that somebody completely different? Uh, I think there was someone else that it yeah. attempted it for, but it fizzled out. Yeah. So this is the latest effort and the one that overcame whatever issue it was and uh, is still ongoing and has certainly garnered quite a bit of attention, not just within Reddit and Civ Fanatics, but has also been picked up by a number of gaming yeah. websites as well mm-hmm. that this is going on. More props to it. Cool. Reported, quote-unquote, game-breaking Civilization Five bug. It was reported on Reddit as well as CFC by Saw Owner. It's already more than 10,000 views for this video on YouTube, where it's described as how technologies in Civilization Five can be stolen without restriction, quote-unquote, as phrased in the video, including a bypass of technologies to take one farther down on the technology tree and the prerequisites in turn. No, we are not going to describe step-by-step how to attempt to do this on the show. Splax77, amongst other posts, did say it's not exactly a new bug. This is just the first time the bug has gotten a lot of attention on this sub, referring to the subreddit, the Civ subreddit on, (laughs) guess what, Reddit. But we certainly haven't reported about it before, and I don't remember coming across this before. Now, maybe that's just me, but even if it's not a new bug, it is apparently still around. Now, dead as says, I have to say this is a terrible game breaker. I will say up front, I'm not certain I would go that far, but it is notable. I mean, not wasting my Uber for you, says, I look forward to abusing this, and Possibility Zero wants to know, what would be the best text to steal, and what is the best way to play exploiting this? <sighs> what it appears to be is an issue with the Enhanced User Interface mod. Now, you might be saying, but... Dan. So that means this is quote-unquote only single-player. Multiplayer doesn't have to worry about this, right? Well, yes, it is technically a mod, but because it's installed as DLC and not a mod, of course, downloadable content doesn't do anything other than change the UI, which means you can use it in multiplayer. The thing that gets me of the comment about it being a game-breaker is that you first have to wait to get to the point in the game where you can actually have spies, You have to have the enhanced user interface. You have to wait for espionage. You have to wait for spy to be able to steal technology. But I do think the biggest issue is you may not necessarily know it has happened. It would trigger you going into another era if you chose a technology that puts you into another era, but not necessarily. So for that reason, you could be selective in getting it. And then, of course, getting all the prerequisite technologies. Of course, you would not be able to get a technology that at least one other sieve, i.e. the sieve that you are spying on and can steal a technology for, has actually received. You're not going to be able to leapfrog somebody in one respect or another, although you could bring yourself a little more in line a bit earlier than you otherwise would have been able to. I'd say it's a bug in the game engine, but the bug is inaccessible by the regular user interface, and the enhanced user interface exposes this bug, says Jeremy Hoffman. So, I guess... No, to be aware of it. I doubt anybody would admit taking it, yeah. <laughs> admit using it. 
Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you play with trusted people, because it's people that you know in a group or you're in a particular league or a group of people that you know have reasonable trust in terms of that they're not going to use this particular bug, then that's great. It's important that it is known and hopefully it is addressed. Okay, first, he used a mod. So the base game is not broken. It is not game breaking. It is a mod, period. And I think some people are very confused what is a modder versus not a mod, especially in the Reddit. They're like, oh, but he just used enhanced user interface. That's not a mod. Actually, it is, because they modded the files. Yeah, no, this is not going to get fixed unless the uh, mod developer themselves fixes it, because it's a mod. It is not something for the developers to go in and go, oh, a mod opened up some exploit. We should fix that. Why? Because then some other mod will come by and create another exploit. It's not up to the developers to deal with mods, except for the fact of making sure that mods can work. Yeah. That's the thing that they need to work on. <laughs> After that, <laughs> you use a mod, that's your own freaking problem. The fact that it can be used in multiplayer is a bit of an issue, but then again, people wanted to use mods in multiplayer anyways. And so that's slightly more questionable because there is sort of a backdoor way to use mods in multiplayer, but everybody sort of needs to have it for it to actually reuse proper mods, I think. But in the end, it is a mod. It is not game-breaking in the slightest. Except for people, yeah, in multiplayer games, if you're online, you should know that potentially people are modding their game when you're playing against them. And, well, just don't play against them again. It's standard form of cheating. You can just join, like, a Civ Steam group, and they have trusted players that you can either report if people are using modded files. Yeah, basically. There's a, at least a couple that try and do that. I don't know how newsworthy this was, but I guess for the multiplayer community, people can use uh, UI-related mods. And by the way, the UI does a lot more than what this thing does. There's a lot of stuff in the UI you can make changes mm -hmm. to that actually affect gameplay. <laughs> it's being talked about in the Civ community now. It's gotten some traction on Reddit, so let's bring it to the greater community's attention through this show, given the MP okay. connection. Although, like and, you said, the whole the ability for people to use mods in multiplayer is problematic, and the notification and management of that could be a little better in terms of who's using what while an MP. But oh, aside yeah, yeah, yeah. that, this is completely in the territory of the mod. Although I would not be surprised if mod dev were to uh, patch that anyway, because people want people using their mod, and stuff like this usually causes well legit people not to do it. Yeah, I suppose if you're really, really, really paranoid about this. You could go in and disable espionage, but I think that's overkill. Yeah, this isn't exactly something that would provide a player a huge advantage while simultaneously going unnoticed either. Kind of notice if someone shot out in front on the tech tree. I mean, I guess you could subtly steal something that's a little bit closer, but uh, come on. <laughs> the bug does have to have some gameplay risk. And there's also a community risk if people figure out. <laughs> yeah, you're the one doing that. You can play with me, myself, and I. Exactly. The AI will never betray you. You can always play with the AI. LOL. <laughs> yeah, you can reprogram it via Lua to be stupider than it was. Exactly. Woohoo! Sipstick's idea to make governance more dynamic and unique. This one started by DEFCON LEET. Another, it actually says DEFCON 1337, but we all know what he meant. And it's an idea. So... As well as selecting your social policy slash civics, you'll have a main government type that will influence the development of your civilization. Civilizations that share government types will have friendlier relations. And he has a list of governments, tribal democracy, federal republic, communist, fascist slash dictatorship, and monarchy. And uh, some proposed benefits and drawbacks for each government. I think those could use a lot of fleshing out. But this is uh, something that was used in previous civilization titles and would not necessarily be bad to bring back. Yeah. What I think this person does is he kind of wedges himself in between the civilization should have government types. No, they should not. They should have social policies. No, they should not. They should have civics. He's like, hey, how about we have all of them? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, see, the thing is, though, like, his proposed benefits, for the most part, would not be too abrasive if added into Civ Five. Like, you could shoehorn these into Civ Five and not destroy the game, as long as you didn't make the parameters too large. But I disagree with a lot of the proposals. First of all, democracy, the whole right-wing versus left-wing party, I mean, come on. 
There's more democracies than one in the world, and a lot of them use more than two parties. Two parties, uh, yeah. And, and let's multiple avoid multiple some parties. of these associations while we're at it as well. And also, <laughs> let's be clear that the U.S. is not a democracy. It's a federal republic. Ah, uh, but that's the next According one According to its own government, it's a republic, not a democracy. So are any of us yeah. from democracies here? Uh, constitutional. So. Monarchy. Yeah. And I never understood, and SIP 4 did this, the whole communist gets more production thing. That, that always struck me as a little awkward. Unhappiness will slowly rise over time in occupied cities until a revolution occurs. So don't go to war much. So you know a revolution is coming. Okay. So... So what was the upsides to communism then? Maybe what the person is trying to get at is you don't want it to be, hey, I can now switch to communism, and so once I hit communism, I have no reason to go to another type to try to have it so that the path is not predictable. Always choose this when you can get it. Don't choose this when you can choose that. Maybe that's what he's going for, but in setting aside realism versus gameplay arguments as just strictly gameplay, that sounds really bad. He's clearly well, saying that you should switch to the dictatorship, mm. and obviously. And All that communism's bad. Too. Except for communism's good at purging religions. Apparently. <laughs> Except, yes. you know, having religion is bad. So you need to purge religion. And you can really produce things, but you can't have money. Um, <laughs> you and you can't expand. <laughs> yeah, you can't have more than 500 gold at any given time. Yes, religion in cities causes unhappiness. Although the sentence, now you can purge religion from your cities with increased production of inquisitors. Pretty sure you can do that already in Civ 5. And but. besides, just because one country said they didn't like religion didn't mean they actually purged religion. Also... There was this other country who also went communist, but had lots of religion. So, Although stop. from a gameplay perspective, yeah. this would be pretty lousy. Like, you switch into this and build a whole bunch of wonders and switch out. Because <laughs> you get increased production for everything. You even put everything in all caps. So mm -hmm. there you go. You just switch in to build a bunch of stuff and then switch out before the revolution. <laughs> Plausible. <laughs> Sounds legit. Well, the only weird thing I see about the Republic is it would make everybody Venice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think everybody wants to be Venice. <laughs> well, it's a stronger version of Venice, though. Yes. Particularly on get... letting the AI decide what units to build. Oh, God. It's a federal republic, yeah. Acts like a puppeted city-state, other than, you know, in your own capital. So, yep, just like in Venice and Civilization V. Only you can select the category of units to produce. Yeah, versus being able to just buy units. Yes. Or as opposed to what if I want to be able to select maybe what type of building, type of building it's constructing, like build food-based buildings. No, I want to build units. Oh. Although well, you can get a lot of extra happiness for it. I guess it depends how much happiness. And again, that goes back to the parameter issue mm. I, I mentioned. It, it depends how much happiness you get. Because if you get, well, just to put an extreme example, 150 happiness, this would be a pretty good government. Whereas if you get uh, just a small bonus, then no one would probably use it because it's not worth giving up the freedom. Let's be clear, at least from my perspective, the precarious part of the Federal Republic one is the large division of your empire can easily result in collapse and breakup. Yeah, yeah that's... Can you flesh out what you mean by that? Yeah, because... I don't think I want Civ 1-style civil wars again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not to take it. He, he sort of hints at other mechanics, because there's obviously no collapse breakup in Civ 5. So was he also suggesting as a knock-on mechanic, is there going to be situations where puppets will break free? Is he trying to add a mechanic that you have to make people happy? Yeah, I don't know. Well, he's trying to add a mechanic for monarchy as well. Like, if your monarch dies and all of a sudden you have to choose between their offspring and they might have different bonuses or penalties. That's, like, much more tame than losing a bunch of cities at random, though. Yeah. <laughs> True, but... <laughs> It also comes across as a bit of a contradiction because you've got that contrasted with increased happiness for the amount of freedom. I'm too damn happy. I'm out of here. Yep. <laughs> what? Yeah, we have lots <laughs> of freedom. Screw you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Take your freedom and shove it. I want to be told what to do and when. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and that's <up> to you. <laughs> or maybe they break when they're unhappy despite your bonuses or, you know, who knows what's in mind there. To me, that meant yeah. nothing outside of being fleshed out. So Yeah, yeah. A lot of stuff that's actually written in here or words to go along with some of these secondary sentences. It's, it's, it's like I'm sitting here, I was thinking about the Federal Republic one, that huh? it would be like Venice, but you can't buy buildings and you can't buy units but what are you doing basically directing the governor what units to build by like putting it on a certain focus like it'll only build granaries or aqueducts or things if you put it on food focus i don't know 
And this yeah. is for Civ Six too, so you you know yeah. it's, yeah. it's yeah. Big assume other things change. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. stuff changes well, too. I like how with fascist dictatorship, there's no downside at all. You just get yep. military unit production, uh, military units yeah. give happiness, annex cities give less unhappiness. No, that's and not how that you get works. Here, <laughs> yep. have a bunch of stuff and no downside. <laughs> no downside. For honor. Mass surveillance makes enemy spies half as likely to succeed. Yeah, it's all positive. Yeah, there's, there's oh, no downside. Oh. You just, <laughs> I'll be a dictatorship, sure. <laughs> the downside is what you don't get by choosing another government type. Well, Just like what that's with any government, though. Looking uh, at what you get for the others, it's a joke. Yeah. And I'm with these pretty be... sure we can look at lots of dictatorships and see that there are actual downsides to being a dictator. Yes, yeah. especially if you're the people that live in the dictatorship. Now, if you want to have a government type where if your empire gets large and could easily result in <laughs> a collapse or like a revolt, now that would be the one. Yeah. Yeah, just kill all the people. Then they can't revolt. Exactly. Problem solved. Monarchy can generate large amounts of tourism and gold in the late game. So A, whatever the late game is defined as. B, I gotta wait till the late game. And C, can generate large amounts. So not necessarily. What puts it in the position to potentially generate large amounts of tourism and gold? And also, why would you want to be a monarchy before that point? And then, secondly, why would you want to be a monarchy in the late game? <laughs> Isn't that the point where the whole monarch thing's been turf? Oh, this realism thing again. Well, apparently <laughs> not. It has the least downside out of most of these governments. So uh, there's a good chance you'd stay in it if you couldn't be a dictatorship. I mean, looking yeah. at it, there's not much downside to being in a monarchy. You get uh, some random bonuses and not a lot of downside. So, hey. Yeah. And uh, can we not have tribal be treated like despotism was in Civilization Four? Because no bonuses or disadvantages. Well, who's going to want to stay in tribal then? I mean, seriously. Who did stay in tribal? It's like a filler spot. People who didn't have the tech to switch governments <laughs> in Civ Four. The other thing was because Civ Four had a, a switching cost, in other words, anarchy, unless you had a yeah, certain yeah. trait, there was some incentive to stay tribal for longer than you might otherwise, because a turn of anarchy is pretty damaging. Yeah, depending on when it hits. But... Yeah, and depending what you get by switching. Yeah. Like switching um, but... something like slavery back then was really good, but if you're just switching to monarchy before you need the happiness, it's a little silly. I mean, no, I'm talking historically. How many people stayed tribal when they... No, you know, but somebody... let's not get into actual history, because what the hell constitutes tribal historically? That, that's... <laughs> and this is gameplay, not realism. So let's yeah, get... let's, yeah. Go, yeah, let's, let's not go that route. Let's give it something. We don't need semantics route. here. Yes, we do. Well, no, there's like there's no <laughs> no that's I can't for this. <laughs> there's no objective criteria for this, and it's well outside the scope of polycast. And, like, yeah, we'll, but... we'll just leave that alone. Anyways, can you mix governments back into the system by having some civics and some social and government stuff? Probably. Can you bring governments back to civ? Probably. Can you do it this way? <laughs> just give different bonuses for every government listed, and sure. Is this even a good way to do it anymore? I mean, uh, thinking about it, just the straight up, okay, you're in this government, you get this bonus. You're in that government, you get that bonus. That's like... Oh, it's the methodology for switching your governments. When do governments yeah. unlock all that? It yeah. could be a good mechanic. And especially when you're talking about a completely new theoretical game with completely yeah. new mechanics. Yeah, I mean, you could do it for sure. And yeah. you could do it well at that. I don't know. It just seems pretty thin. It'd be like, well, yeah, but I make mean, a new like, game. We've got governments. What do you do? Uh, you press scratch one all these minor benefits it. and like have <laughs> stuff like the Civ Two thing where democracies could be forced out of war if they went on for too long oh. and crap like that. Like mm -hmm. that's not a fun example, but it's an example of something that could make each of the governments unique mechanic wise and give you trade offs between using them. It, it's not bad conceptually and it, yeah. and it could add to the game my, my point is more in the broad stroke if you're going to bring something back bring it back in a big way not just a lipstick well, sort yeah. of way or have it in space <laughs> yep there we go right now governments to be on earth let's go <laughs> <laughs> i want to be a monarchy in space I think what's going on with all the complications in the quote unquote later game governments, maybe this person is trying to stress you out so much that you just go back to tribal because it's just simple. I can't take it anymore. No, you need to be a dictator, Dan. You're the obvious winner here is dictatorship. I would go with the whole concept of the base seed of something chosen, but then you have your options. So you could be a monarchy, 
just a pure unadulterated monarchy. You could be a constitutional one because you have constitutions, but constitutions could also be shared with the republics and democracies and stuff like that. So you have layer them up so you can make different styles, and then these would just be the overall basket concepts. You could... Then you could have democracy back in the classical era, you know, when it was originally conceived. And then over the length of the game, you could open up choices for that. Inevitably, and it's already come up in this discussion, the labeling of these governments have been problematic because we're basing them on real, quote unquote, real government types. So let's come up with their names. Tribal is dull. <laughs> PDX Shark comes up with a thread about requiring the enforcement of embargoes. And so this starts mostly about the fact that when you embargo somebody via the UN or specific resources or luxuries, then you would actually have to go physically do that. Not just, hey, look, I got a vote. Oh, you're embargoed. No one can trade with you without anybody actually, you know, doing anything. Because then you couldn't have an embargoed country trading with somebody on the side, stuff like that. So anyways, countries that voted yes must actually blockade ports with physical units. So it creates a tense situation in which your units are exposed close to a city and its units. The only problem with that is if you're not actually at war, then you can't get into their territory to actually blockade at that range. <laughs> this would require a change in uh, that restriction. Yeah, yeah a little uh, adjustment. I'd just like to point out that from a definition standpoint, there is a difference between blockading somebody and embargoing their goods. Yeah. And that you can, in fact, embargo a nation by simply refusing to accept them in your own ports and not anything else. That's still an embargo. Say the U.S. decided to ban goods from some foreign country. That's an embargo. It doesn't require U.S. ships that sit out there and block them from leaving their own port. It's just you don't buy goods in this country. It's illegal yeah, to do can. it. Usually exactly. that's considered a declaration of war. <laughs> yeah. Usually lining up your military outside someone's borders is, yeah, not smiled upon. Yeah. Um, I think the concept he's going for there is, okay, let's put this in Civ 5 turns. There are trade routes, and they obviously go around on the map. And so instead of having to be in their territory, because that's just not going to happen, then if you're going to stop somebody from trading, you would actually put your physical units on their trade routes. To it's actually not an block embargo. Them. It's a blockade. It's well, a blockade. You, that's to stop trade routes route. with an embargo is to not trade with them. Yeah. That, that's it. I refuse to trade with you. Mama. And if you all voted to that and the game makes it compulsory such that you cannot send trade units to that country or receive trade units from that country, then the embargo is in place already. That's an embargo. Yeah. Although he's trying to nuance uh, voted yes versus voted no. Oh, uh, I see. But that's not part of the game at the moment. Right now, as long as it passes, whether you said yes or not. Never! Defy no. resolution. Yeah, defiance yeah, penalty. No, yeah, there's no defiance penalty in Civ 5, or defiance at all in Civ 5, so... That was, I loved that, and the way they wrote it in Civ 4 is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Never! Then the angry face. <sighs> then something about trade unit infections. Yeah, if a luxury or resource is banned but your civ is trading it with someone else, there is a chance it could be uncovered during this inspection. Oh no, at this point the leader has the choice to allow inspection or to deny it. Attempting an inspection would incur a slight diplomatic penalty, while denying one would be significant, potentially leading to an embargo vote. Um, WND is trading gold. I'm going to point out if any country decided to, I don't know, randomly jump onto a ship of another country to Inspect check it out. Inspect their wares so that when might it's start not, a war. When it's not in their territory. <laughs> yeah, that might be kind of... You're the person getting the Diplo penalty, not the other person. Yeah. At that point, as a country, you'd probably be best off just disowning the ship and claiming that they're pirates. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's all that's going to happen anyways. Not to mention all ships are pretty much flagged from some other random place anyways. This is just person. way underneath the game's level of abstraction. Yeah. We we're talking about, like, thousands of year scale, and embargoes function about how they should in the game already. Although I did think blockading of ports should have some effect on trade. Oh, sure, you're... absolutely. Absolutely. That's not this mechanic, but I agree with you. So say you're actually at war with somebody, and you blockade them. Or you're just blockading, like, not an actual full-out war, but you're blockading. 
you can line your ships up outside and wherever your ships and or zone of control around the ships, depending, the person trying to send a trade route would basically treat that like mountains or whatever and the trade route wouldn't go through it. Yeah, why'd they take that out? I guess they didn't want to put it in like they did with Civ 4. Like, it would take programming effort to put it in. But that was in Civ 4, and it was significant. It was not the end-all, be-all, but you could actually cut off cities from being able to build certain unit classes if they didn't have a land connection to the resource by blockading, in addition to blocking all of their ocean-based trade routes. And you wouldn't win wars with just that alone, but it was a significant factor in wars sometimes. Well, also, if you surround a city with land units and actually surround it, then no food could get transported in. Like, land-based trade routes would not work, so... That's true. Unless the uh, place is able to produce its own food, it would eventually starve to death. And that would cause more amusement. Because then you don't have to go take a city to cause a lot of trouble. You just sit outside of its range and just wait for it to go. Yeah, and although that's prohibitively expensive in Civ Five and Village yeah. Ghost Game, it would still be a nice element because it would have situational use. Well, also at the point where somebody has walls plus castles, but you don't have trebuchets. Yeah. Then you could at least starve them. It would provide for a different way to wage war, especially if you can't take, because you just can't deal with the defenses. Yeah. It would add a tactical air to the game. It wouldn't hurt it. Although I'd hate to be a one-tile island at that point. Yeah. (laughs) But then again, that's a vulnerability of such, and that's reasonable. Yeah, that's true. Although even right now, you can't use any of your tiles if there's an enemy ship anywhere near you. Because yeah. the blockade works sort of like that, but that's more about working the tiles than it is about trade. Whereas blockade well, that'll starve you too. Trade. Oh, it'll starve you worse. Yeah. <laughs> if you have no access to tiles and you're one tile island. Early gold pile. A thread by Finn80. What to do with an early gold pile? He's asking. Don't have one in the first place. Woohoo! <laughs> Buy things. Buy things. He plays on uh, different levels, the king or emperor, and he has his initial build order down. But he's wondering what to do with the early gold, whether it's saving for a scout at 140 on varying speeds, using it for city-states, or possibly saving for a settler. The Red Axe post said he has a lot of good ideas here. It really depends on the situation. Whether your capital is poor production and you're playing tradition, maybe an early settler would help you expand. Maybe you have early city-states that require trade routes, or you want to trade with the AI for early science, so a caravan would be useful. Buying a library in a second city if you have one out. Or if you have stone and marble, maybe you want a useful building like stonework so it'll increase production. The only one I immediately negatively react to is buying a caravan. Mm, depends on your production ability. If you're, and if you, like, find skill Dorado or something. Yeah, it sort of depends on your cash. Like, if your capital is food-heavy, but not so much on the production, caravans can take a very long time to make, and therefore... You can crank up more gold and or science because it also depends on your difficulty level. Exactly. On the science side of things. That could be a huge boost in the early game. And it can also help fund possibly an early war against different AI. Mm-hmm. It could, although then I, I would question the settling choice then, that your production is so poor to be able to construct a caravan. Maybe it's got a crazy amount of cash. It's got lots of luxuries. There you go. Well, then in which case I would recommend buying a workshop to increase your production then. Uh, it's a bit ways away, though, from the early Yeah. Game. If you know that from the outset, then you can be going towards being able to do that. Yeah. I would suggest not buying the second scout. That's the thing I would probably say, don't do that. <laughs> Cause... Oh, yeah, what are you going to get from that second scout versus that gold? It's yeah. unlikely compared to buying something else that that's going to give you more stuff than yeah, just uh, and, buying something else. And besides, once you do your order of scout monument granary, you can usually kick out the second scout if you actually want one within one to two turns, depending on your production. So there's a good chance that you can just build it. Buying a worker to improve your tiles, depending on your start, like if you're planning on staying just your capital for a little bit, or even if you went liberty and you headed straight towards the uh, cheaper settlers, then buying a worker to go with the free worker would work. Because instead of buying a free settler, you would have two workers improving your tiles, which you might actually need a lot of. And you can bring that second worker with the uh, cheap and or free settler to run around and start improving the next city already. I think dying for the building for the second city is always hugely beneficial, if, depending yeah. on where the land is. If you settle that second city on a hill and has like a sheep on hill, then the production isn't so bad. But if you're trying to get that natural wonder that doesn't have any production tiles around it, or if it's nothing but a banana jungle city, getting that granary if you're not going tradition or monument or shrine if you're going religion, 
can be a huge benefit. Mm, or library. Yep. Usually in that case, it's the library. If you save up and you're trying to go for early national college or you spammed out cities and then you're going for national college, then you usually have to end up buying a library somewhere. Oh, yeah. Because you don't want to wait. Yeah, unless you want to wait forever for something to finish. Yeah. So you'll end up needing the money to buy libraries if you expand and want to go national college quick. So that's definitely true. Also depends on your tech path, too, and what's around you. Mm -hmm. Buying Uh, work boats isn't too bad, either. I hate work boats. Well... Just in general. (laughs) Yeah. I agree. Maybe a lighthouse, actually. If you're on the coast with a lot of stuff, I'd rather buy the lighthouse rather than the uh, work boat. Because lighthouse will give you production. It doesn't give you luxury resources, though. Who cares? He doesn't want happy people. He just needs workers. I need production. I don't need happiness. <laughs> I like using the gold for an archer so I can protect workers. Protecting workers. Kill barbarians. Farm them. Kill barbarians. Yep. And as we said up front about saving it, no, because lock and load does say that. He's like, save it. I assume I will need to buy units or walls when attacked, but sometimes you are far enough away. If you hold on to the gold, you can minimize maintenance costs. <sighs> This is one of the few times where Civ and StarCraft have a few similarities. If you have a resource, you should use it to improve your position yeah. sooner yeah. than later. Yeah, I'm, maintenance costs, I, I first kind of read that and went, what? I'm like, oh, you're talking about running a deficit. Oh. Yeah, if you run Why a deficit. Why are you running a deficit? <laughs> well, because you could easily not have built your caravan. Yes, I know. <laughs> Sorry. There, yes, thank you. Built. Uh, well, let's bought. save money rather than buying that caravan. Hello. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Or you could just slowly piss away your gold that way, or, you know, buy something that'll actually help you get more, and then you don't have to piss it away. Yeah. Eh? Eh? I also read that, and I thought, look, you're not America from Civilization Revolution. Why you save? Yeah, I can't um, think of too many strategy games in general, or it's a good idea to float a ton of money. Except for those rare times where you get some percentage of your total amount yep. each turn, in but which case then... you can eventually climb it. Well, if you use certain exploits to get enough money quickly to make that meaningful, okay. But that's a very fringe case. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Even then, they end up trying to nerf it. Yeah. Because, well, if you can save up this much and get basically equivalent income <laughs> yeah. just by having some around, then that's kind of silly. What are you doing with that money? Are you loaning it to people? Oh, and also in Civilization Revolution, you have so much gold banked and you get to that point, then you get, woohoo, free settler unit. Oh, like, oh, okay. Well, yeah, there's or, those bonuses, yeah. But this is not Civilization Revolution. Again, nope. still. <laughs> but still, yes, it's a be as close to zero without going under plan. And even if you can go under for a while, because Civ 5 doesn't really kill you on units. Beyond Earth does. Usually for going under and not having any gold and being in a deficit, that's the science hit. Yeah, that's just a little annoying. That will really hurt you. That'll hurt you more. Unless you're running caravans. Should have bought that caravan. Made an investment. Should have bought the caravan. (laughs) Built the caravan. I mean, save up for something. (laughs) I was about to say, yes, don't save your money. This is not realism. (laughs) This is game. (laughs) The only reason to save money is to pay for something slightly later down the road. How to kill everyone. In multiplayer, let us clarify. Serial killer wins. (laughs) Killer robots. From T.S. Chucky. Most multiplayer games end with one guy cleaning up the map. To be this guy requires a strong empire, and it requires not to be killed before your time comes. Here are some guidelines on how to set up your empire (laughs) and how to survive. Really? To be the guy who wins, you have to not get killed? Yeah. Really? (laughs) Yeah. I missed that part. I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, way, dude. And uh, yes, if you want to troll this quote, you could say, Guy, sexist. Yeah. (laughs) People die when they are killed. Maybe it needs a disclaimer, must be alive to accomplish. Yeah, pretty much. And up front, Deadpool is like, it makes me sad that it seems Domination is the major victory type for multiplayer. It is my least favorite way to play single player. Okay, well, number one, if it's your least favorite way to play in single player, that doesn't necessarily mean it will end up being your least favorite way to play in multiplayer. And if you really hate it that much, you could just have it be that no one declares war on anybody. I mean, we don't have an always peace option like we had in Civilization IV, but find a group of people that want to win by other means. Huh? Show of hands, who used that option in Civ Four, by the way? On purpose. Yes, on, on purpose. <laughs> Are we showing hands? Not misclicks. I don't think we can see this through the internet. Yeah, not, well, we can, yeah. but... Yeah, I don't see any hands, lol. <laughs> no, no, no. I have proven my point, somehow. There are lots of things we don't want to see through the internet. Mm-hmm. 
Um, <laughs> you don't know that for sure. That's just confirmation bias, Dan. First sentence like, on turn zero, the first thing you do is click victory progress to see all the civs in the game. Make a mental note about the special military units you may face and the tech at which they become available. Uh, <laughs> I always find that kind of lulzy. Find out what civs are in the game. Go to victory progress. But hey, yeah, sure. A low score indicates that there are water tiles in their capital. This is crucial knowledge, especially when you are coastal. Once everyone has settled, do not care about this ranking anymore. Points are meaningless. Demographics is what counts. I don't know. Points, actually, they are meaningless generally, but if somebody has super high points versus you, they probably have a bigger empire than you. So it's not entirely meaningless. Although you but can probably so. glean that data pretty easily from the demographics or looking at the map yeah. also. You True. can just go to diplomacy and look at their score and how it's broken down. Yeah. Check the demographics each turn and check the tech tree regularly to know who is doing what. I don't know about every turn. Also check the golden resources the other guys have. Check the military score. Watch it religiously. Yeah, I mean, that gives you some indication, although you don't necessarily know what the composition is, where the military units are relative to their land and your land. It's still good advice, because if someone's yes. military score spikes across a short period of time, there's some writing on the wall there. <laughs> so it's better to do that than not do it. Yes. Build two scouts first. Find spots to settle and find out if they are contested. Settle the contested spots first to find your land. When settling contested spots, put an emphasis on defendability. No, really. <laughs> Build on a hill. More so than normal. Yeah. Yes. It is often the best play to sacrifice a river or a mountain in order to create a city that will be extremely hard to attack. I don't know why you'd have to sacrifice a mountain, because a mountain would very much <laughs> help to make it a little more difficult. Back it up into the mountains where there's only two tiles to attack from right next to the city. There you go. Well, there you go. Well, really hard to attack, except that it might also not be able to produce. And probably get starved to death if you yeah. fill it with units. There's a balance point yeah. there, to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> Find out where the others are. I would have moved that farther up. In yeah. <laughs> probably could be a little <laughs> higher up on the list. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Well, it's implied with which spots are contested, though. Like, yeah. You're not going to know that unless you know where the others are. Gotta build those scouts. The, the gist is okay. Let's not go too far into the construct of the writing. Yeah. This isn't a paper for grading. It can be. Oh, I like this thought. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I know your nature case. will make you evaluate that a little <laughs> bit extra, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree, it kind of makes it seem silly to me too. I mean, that line should have probably been a paragraph up, but that's fine, that's fine. Let's continue. <laughs> so at this point, it may turn out that you have to kill someone near you in order to not let them have camels, keshiks, or whatever. This is especially true when you find a capital near you on flat land that is easily accessible. Oh, look, that flat land near you, easily accessible enemy city, I, regardless of when you're going to get your unique unit, that makes it an insta-target, absolutely. Early war will always handicap you. It will delay the development of your empire. Uh, unless you take out all your opponents. So you need a good reason to get at someone's throat. Like, referring to your previous paragraph, you find a capital near you that's easily accessible on flat land. <laughs> <laughs> Just box them in right away. Basically, if your neighbor didn't read this to say go land on defensible territory, go kill them. Because they yeah. didn't need this. <laughs> Although it's true, like if you commit to an early war, you darn well better be successful in your early <laughs> well, war. That's because yeah. otherwise you're that's hosed. It <laughs> that's it. But that's the reality. If you go to war and you do not take something, or at least sufficiently amount equal to what you put into trying to go to war to keep you up and running, then yes, that was a bad choice. And you will probably die. But if you can take out a bunch of stuff, like, say I go Assyria, build out six of the uh, siege towers, and take down five or six cities with those in decent locations. Then I just built an empire with much less tech. And there's also a balance in there in terms of even through the early war, even if you are successful and you end up taking one or more cities of that civ, if it's too prolonged, then just like the civilization that you eventually get rid of, you spent all that time and investment and resources into that war, then yes, you won that war. Unless that's the last civ, there's probably somebody else watching what's going on. And now you're in a weakened state because of that prolonged early war. Yeah. 
So sometimes it's it can be a hollow victory too. You want to be able to take the city and you want to be able to take the city in a reasonable amount of time. Now, whatever that reasonable time out it is depends on the game speed. It depends on what particular area you're in, where other civs are. But yeah, absolute statements are absolutely problematic. Early war will not always handicap you, but a prolonged early war will handicap you. Yep. Just how much will it handicap you? Will you be able to recover? That's key. Mm-hmm. Yep. T.S. Chucky says further, if you only have room for three crappy cities, your land is not winnable. Because uh, he's also saying the other thing that you need to do here is to get winnable land. There is a nice rule of thumb. If after labs, that's research labs, if after research labs with the first three rationalism tenants, you make 1,000 beakers or more, your land was winnable. If you cannot come close to 1,000 beakers, your land wasn't good enough, and you should have done something about this earlier. <laughs> to get to 1,000 beakers requires four good cities. Why is this a nice rule of thumb? A thousand beakers is useful to have, but... If everybody else also has a thousand beakers. Are you in advanced starts? Like, you need a better earlier gauge to evaluate your progress. I gotta point out, if you wait two labs (laughs) at the end of the game to decide whether or not... Your land was good enough or not, uh... It's a little late to decide that. Especially if you you died along the way. If you got conquered, your land probably wasn't good enough. Yeah. Or you were. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's beside the point. It's about the land. You did not get winnable land. It does not matter if that was because your land was not good enough or because you weren't, but you did not get winnable land if you are dead. I know yeah. in the multiplayer games that crazy high population capital is usually how they reach this thousand beaker mark. That's why they don't want to expand too much because of the tech costs and the happiness increase once they have that super giant place. Yeah, well, it's also tradition better than liberty, et cetera, et cetera, even in single player. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Four city tall is pretty much the dominant strategy. You can use other stuff, but reality is not so much. He cites that the two crucial military units accessible to everyone are frigates and artillery. Yeah. Um, I, you can get okay. to them. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, and if the iron isn't on the other side of the map. I, I'm more agreeing with this than the previous comment about labs and <laughs> rationalism tenants. Frigates are a huge factor once your empire is not the only coastal one. And we will say, assuming, of course, that it's a map that has coast. Of course. Mm, yeah, yeah. Or where the coast is actually an issue. <laughs> Scout the coast, see who has a cap that could be shot from a lot of water tiles. Then you could go for the kill or for diplomacy. Or? Diplomacy? <laughs> I think instead of diplomacy, it might be extortion. Or lying. Well, it's, it, he then explains, <laughs> since rushing frigates would delay your tech, you could also talk to the other coastal guys. Here's what this guy's again. Okay, ha. Huh. Mm-hmm. And talk to the other coastal guys and agree not to frigate rush each other. <laughs> you could. Wait, uh-huh. what? Gentle, like, gentlemen's hey, agreement, let's not rush. Whoa. Right. How many can times have people just said say, that then killed each other? Trust is an excellent quality for other people to have in MP games. <laughs> <laughs> so, for and diplomacy is a factor. Yeah, for other people. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You want other people to trust you, yeah, so you the win. Thing for other people to have, see? That's the star. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the point of diplomacy, is to instill trust in others. <laughs> Just label everyone a backstabber, and you'll be perfectly fine with your trust issues. Yeah. And you're a backstabber, and the, you're a backstabber, and you're a backstabber. You're but all backstabbers. Can, you can make them think that you're not a backstabber, in addition to knowing that they probably will be. That's perfect. And I have a knife for you, and a knife for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you mean, I have a nuke for you, and I have a nuke for you. <laughs> I don't know. I read that and I thought, did you start playing a single player game suddenly? I just, uh, diplomacy and MP, I just, and domination, I just, okay, I can see it in certain situations, but this is supposed to be a quick guide. No, Dan, if you want to frigate rush somebody, you don't want them also building frigates. It's perfect. There's diplomacy there. Yeah. Artillery is a game breaking unit. Also, in the sense, it can break you. Hmm. Okay, artillery, yes, but I'm thinking more a little earlier in the game. You get yourself cannons before other people do. With cannons, you can. Yeah, yeah, I'd be a little more concerned about that, just in terms of the chronology. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, in multiplayer, people will actually pull out a horse unit to go behind the lines to kill the cannons, or at least are more likely to not sit there and let you cannon spam them. And, exactly. as well you're also likely to have your own cannons. So it'll be cannon versus cannon. There won't be a front line, which means defender wins. And with the uh, ranged cavalry units like the Keshiks or the Camel Archers being highly sought after in multiplayer, yep. the cannons are even more vulnerable. God, trying to defend cannons from Keshiks doesn't sound fun. 
but uh, the whole artillery thing, it's that whole three range, I boom you from huge distance. And, and over terrain. Yeah, so it becomes way less of a problem. But the funny thing is his logic here is actually a little goofy. Yeah, uh, I agree. So he says, if you're in a game, don't go artillery after universities because you have to kill everybody. Because if you don't, you're going to be behind in tech. Okay, that makes sense, because others will go to public schools. Okay. The problem is, anybody who goes to public schools didn't go to cannons. I went to public <laughs> school as a child. Yeah. You didn't get a free cannon, did you? No, I didn't. No, no they didn't give me a free cannon either. I would have loved to have a free cannon. <laughs> but... I'm not sure how I could have moved it as a cannon. They're pretty heavy, <laughs> but it would have been awesome. So, if somebody goes heavy on the military side against a lot of people who just teched, those people who teched eventually have to go back to the military side, or they have to hope that they can jump into infantry really, really quickly, which means that even if you go university to cannons plus gunpowder, you're still going to out-unit the people who went to public schools directly. Yeah. But the worst part about the logic, not just that, maybe he includes people who go to gunpowder and cannons first and then go to public schools rather than continue up to artillery. But the worst part of the logic is the next one. Yeah. In a game with noobish players, on the other hand, you will regularly encounter opponents who take this path. So noobs go to artillery, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so once again, be aware of what's going on around you. Check the tech tree. That makes sense. If your neighbors go artillery, you are forced to dig deep into the tech tree as well. So don't go to artillery because experienced players will put you hopelessly behind in tech and they will not have actual <laughs> weapons to defend against you. But a noob who goes artillery makes you change your tech path. Or you but, die. But yeah. experienced player who goes to artillery does not make you change your deck back. I don't know what to say to that. There's, <laughs> <laughs> There's something weird in there. Hi, bud. Uh, or is this an extension of his quote-unquote diplomacy where he goes artillery while convincing everyone else to go public schools? Because that's about the only thing I could see that makes sense. The logic in the last two paragraphs just doesn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> if go artillery is so strong that going it forces good players to also go artillery to survive, then you, you might as well go artillery and kill anybody who doesn't go artillery. Yes. Thanks for your public schools. Yeah. Now I have tech. They're useful. <laughs> that is the point of going to a military unit that is more powerful than what is around to use it to get their stuff because they went peaceful and you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Now, granted, if you go to artillery and you can't use it to take somebody else's stuff because they weren't dumb, then you went to artillery and lost the opportunity to use it, and therefore you will be behind in tech. Well, but, a unit like artillery, they probably went artillery too. If they are surviving that easily. That or they're like across water. I mean, okay, if you're playing an islands game or something, well, then that, maybe you don't want to rush artillery. <laughs> but I mean, come on, <laughs> that would be <laughs> that really... should be obvious. But I mean, whatever. You could go bombers. Yeah. But the thing about air units, you have to go to biology and to flight. And once you get those, there's your problem. Yeah, they destroy artillery with these. You need anti-aircraft guns or your own planes. Yeah. And if you went to artillery and somebody went to flight with biology, of course, they actually need that. Then, then, and only then, did going artillery be a really, really, really bad plan. And that's if you don't also manage to deny them the resources they need to build those units. Well, you'd have to have gone to biology to find out where the oil was. If you're going artillery, you should already have a huge cannon force to and gold piled to get the most out of the unit. Yeah. is looking for console, PC, and mobile game players to playtest upcoming and existing games. You can test taking simple surveys to actual in-house live gameplay sessions. Woo! They'll come to your house and play with you. <laughs> not creepy That's at not all. Not quite on the last <laughs> point there. <laughs> um, gamers who participate in testing will be rewarded for the time and help. Note, this is not a job application or offer. Just to make sure... They don't want to actually pay you or have a contract with you or anything else. They just want you to sign up so that you can, you know, tell them stuff. Well, I think it was an important preface that this is not a job application. Yeah, yeah. But I like that. This is not a job offer. We're offering you a job. Please give us your information and we will give you a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to give you the offer before we even know anything about you. <laughs> what? <laughs> 
I think that was all. Think legal people just trying to be legal and cover their yeah. bases. Your yes, job but... description is guinea yeah. pig. I know it's right up there with why there's hot coffee on cups. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's also so that you can't go online and update your resume as I'm a 2K tester because no, you're not. Well, you could. Yeah, it, nothing's it stopping you from doing it except you know maybe the law, <laughs> but you could still do it. <laughs> So, yeah, they want people to play their games and give them feedback in the generalized sense of the word, otherwise known as either focus testing. Oh, and if you're chosen, they will gladly thank you with a game of your choice or gift card. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it has to be one of their games. Yeah, it's going to have to be one of their games. <laughs> I don't know. It just says game of your choice. I would like Halo, please. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, or gift card. So, hey, the gift card could be anywhere. <laughs> Ooh. Anywhere. Give me a thousand dollar WoW gift card. <laughs> yeah. It'll only take two weeks to burn through it. <laughs> but shiny mounts. They do ask gender, and then have you worked in any of the following fields? Marketing, research, public relations, or advertising? Yep. And then you can also check none. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a hint. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yeah. This could help you. Or it could be we really don't want you to have worked in any of these fields. I guess you could look at it that way. We do not want any one of you. I'm pretty sure it's the latter, not the former. Work in the game industry before, and if so, tell us where. No. <laughs> this is not a job application. I don't have to tell you that. And which of the following gaming platforms do you play games on yes. and are comfortable discussing in a group? Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm only comfortable discussing this with myself, so. Yeah. Or I'm okay to talk to people about all the PC games I've played, but I really don't want to talk to people about all the Vita games I play on the side. <laughs> you can put platforms there that they don't even have games for. Yeah. <laughs> it's all my Nintendo experience gone to waste. Darn. I want to know how many hours per week you play games and your top five favorite video games. Not yours. Yeah. I feel like someone probably did that in a troll post. And then there's the, how would you describe your general skill level? It's an all cap, so I have to yell it. Skill level with video games. No experience. <laughs> Casual, moderate, advanced, and expert. In all games? Yeah, as abstract. In games in general. Yeah, which yeah. kind? I'm an expert at everything. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And anybody and, who says otherwise is a filthy casual. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> filthy castle. And then they want you to rank your favorite genre of games from 1 to 8. Yes. RPG, action, adventure, MOBA, massive multiplayer online, shooter, FPS, strategy, mobile, and sports. This mobile sort of sounds like count. it's actually just a pure survey. They don't actually want you to do anything for them. <laughs> Like, just tell us what games you like. Oh, they do want you to do something for them. They want you to provide them with the survey, market yeah. research data. Yeah. <laughs> and back a point that says, we will try to match you with upcoming places. <laughs> so. Maybe yes, maybe no. Call, Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. Oh, you know the new type of players. They always crank up the difficulty level and expect it to be easy. Well, and that's their own default. Yeah. <laughs> but then you have to deal with all the whining and the complaining, and the make it easier... Sometimes they're right, though, like a big Civ fan or something. It's like, yeah, I'll just do D&D. &D. That's what I do. It works. Yeah. Anyway, this has been episode 226 of Polyguest. I am joined by the usual crew of Dan Q. You want to be my tester? Me and team. I define sounds legit. <laughs> Mad Jen. Meow. Who is been by a cat. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Meowing. Mad Jen got, uh, oh, okay. got the cat explosion. The cat has been that was really quiet for me, although I heard something. Something, so something, cat. Something cat. Out. Try again. We recommend not taking the microphone internally. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's true. I, I do recommend against that as well. <laughs> Depends on which internal, but yes. I, I don't think that at any point in a microphone <laughs> should qualify as being internal.
<laughs> relative to a person. Oh, dear. Oh, we need to, you know what? Now that we've said that, all microphones should have for external use only. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Actually, man. I'm pretty sure they do. <laughs> Probably. Somewhere in the manual. So many things have to have that said because it's just dumb. There's always that one person who tries. Yeah. And then tries to sue, but it didn't say that it wasn't for internal use. I think I might have the episode title. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, Not for uh, consumption. We don't only have one crazy canic, we have three of them. I'm Cuckoo for Maple Syrup. Yeah, you might want to sneak in your own name there at the end. Yeah, by the way, you should actually... Since we derailed you. You derailed me. I'm one crazy Canadian. Reporting for duty. Record date? April 18th, 2015. Civilization 4, 5, and Beyond Earth Sound Clips. Copyright Take 2 Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.